John Summers is the motoring historian. He was a company car thrashing technology sales rep that turned into a fairly inept sports bike rider. Hailing from California, he collects cars and bikes built with plenty of cheap and fast and not much reliable. On his show, he gets together with various co-hosts to talk about new and old cars, driving, motorbikes, motor racing, and motoring travel. Good day, good morning, good afternoon. It is John Summers, the motoring historian. Um, doing another one of these on my own, I, I guess, because uh, I recently had a trip to England and did a lot of, of car-related things. Um, so a bit to talk about there. I always feel like it's important to begin with what's uh, with what's really important, and and I always want this to be like a document of of my own um motoring experiences and and uh i guess you know the 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 dog is at my feet as as we speak sitting on my feet and and for the last six months you know and and even recording this pod now is at the expense of going out for a walk with him and that really illustrates uh you know how my life has has been over the six or seven months that that we as a as a family have have had him um and i guess a lot of the time that i spent fiddling around with cars and bikes i haven't spent fiddling around with cars and bikes right and and uh, the bikes particularly had reached a pretty parlous state now there's there's i mean there's a lot of them it's it's you know, it's it's less than twenty five, but it's it's you know more than fifteen at the moment, and um, uh, and it reached a point where bloody none of them worked. I mean, how embarrassing is uh, is that? I <laughs> um, so I I suppose you know now where I I'm feeling better about the whole thing because there's there's three that work now i i was able to persuade the venerable uh honda shadow that was gifted me and i went and picked up in in gold country last year um i managed to get that started it had not wanted to start before and i guess it's because um the jigsaws have a a choke that goes down to be on and up to be off and and the ducati has this weird toggling mechanism that i i can't quite figure but it's more of a feel than a um, it's like clicks closed, so you know when it's open and fully open by the way that it feels. And the Jixers, they're like upside down from Honda in terms of how you do the choke. So anyway, I guess I'd struggled to get the, the Honda started uh, the last time. Anyways, that runs. Um, more importantly, John has uh, just done the clutch in the... 2001 Suzuki GSX-R K1 that I have, 1000 K1 that I have that was owned by that Irish road race guy. Now, I guess the it's a fairly well-known thing on them that the clutches become herky-jerky. Um, and it's also something that you won't appreciate if you didn't ride those bikes sort of in period in the way that I did, is that the fueling the 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 fueling is is not good and what we mean by that is that this is early stage fuel injection and we mean that the bike is going to rev out to 14 grand now the fueling will be good at 14 and it will be good at 10 and it will be good at 8 and it will be good at 7 be good at 5 but what you tend to find is that 3 or 4 grand range it can be a a bit hit and miss uh, especially if the fuel's not good and and uh you know now uh the way the uh somebody like the lad that had me had it before before me john or, or neil the, the lad before that the irish afm <laughs> road race guy he uh um you know he just ride it very aggressively it had no mirrors on it because you know you're not looking back you're riding it and if you ride it like that if you come into throttle sharply if you go through the gears in a sharp way it was it was all right or at least it was for um about the 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 first year or so that 
sort of first year or so for for a period when i had it i felt like it was all right but but there was a moment there where um I struggled to get the clutch to disengage and my hand was tired and I was mentally tired and it tried to put me into the middle of an interception, a busy like intersection. Um, and it, it absolutely scared the shit out of me. Um, and I've not ridden it for, for a little bit. Well, John had the clutch apart and it had all this horrible, milky, oily shit in it, right? And, and, uh, anyway, so it's got a new clutch. Um, it also has not just the new clutch, but it also has a modification, which is well known on the Suzuki forums. Like, like, you know, is, is, is you fit a clutch ring from a later Kawasaki ZX-10. So in fact, the, the CX-10 the ZX-10R C1 2005 bike that, that I have, the, the sort of peak analog bike, 180 horse, um, no aids whatsoever, peak analog, peak power after that analog. That um, that bike, the, you fit a clutch ring from that bike to the 2001 Dixa Thou, and you get a bike that has a much smoother clutch on it. Now, um, when the clutch first seized up, John was like, well, I was like, how do you fix it? And he went, well, you zip tight and you hold it. You, you leave it in for a bit and then you see what's going to happen. And he and Neil, when John was buying it off, Neil had identified that as a problem and they changed the, the oil. So this milkiness had come in in the time that I guess since he and Neil had done it. That's probably 10 years now. Um, and, and, you know, you think about it, the bike is now 24 years old, which is, is, is astonishing. Um, astonishing really. Um, I, so yeah, so John did the oil for me. He did this gearbox, he did this clutch change on me and he fitted, did this modification where you fit a clutch ring from a ZX-10R to uh the and it makes the, the the clutch smoother he also did a test ride for me um leaving me comfortable that uh you know it, it was going to be all right for, for for me to ride it so so that bike um now is is working again and i've satisfied myself that that john um did some work on what i've got to say is my favorite bike which is the 2005 gsxr 1000 that i paid like two thousand dollars for in the days before the, the the pandemic um it has um an oil leak um i think it probably always had it um and for a minute there after john did the work on it because the plastic was off and because it was like all down the block um from because the leak is from right in in the middle um i did a ride and i came back and there was oil all on my right hand boot and if it's all on my boot, it's all on the fucking tire, isn't it? Let's make no mistake. So, so that um, put me off that bike a little bit, but I've run it up since and it doesn't, you know, it leaks a bit, but so does every Norton or, or, you know, BSA you've ever seen, haven't you? So I don't want to, it would be hypocritical as an Englishman to begrudge a, a motorcycle, a little bit of, of, of an oil leak. Um, and John, for me earlier in the year had done um a full service on on that bike had identified the leak had tried to to, to fix it in some ways and we we talked about it um and talked about how based upon all the debris and the bottom of the fairing probably that it was sort of leaking like that all the uh all, all the time um i'm sitting here looking at it right now um i went out for a ride on it um, so this is the, 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 my beginning story, which I've taken and the usual rambling approach up to, um, and I guess I should entitle the story, you know, I, I, what I wrote down was, um, I, I've seen God and he rides a GSXR because I've done three motorcycle rides after you know the reason i was driveling on about the dog was the dog occupied all my time and i hadn't i hadn't ridden and then in the last three days i've done three rides 
the first one was on the the k5 and i i really i never when i go out i'm i never think to myself i'm going to ride really fast i just go out to stretch the motorcycle's legs and in this case well not even stretch its legs just just have a ride i don't you know i didn't have i didn't even have a have a route in mind as i as i rolled down a hill away from the house all i wanted to do was make sure there wasn't oil on my boot and i kept on stopping at the lights i i kept i at the first sort of stop sign i i i looked at my uh at my boot there and there was no oil on it and and rolling along um the 30 mile an hour speed limit along past the ocean there i was looking at my boot again and there didn't seem to be uh any any oil on it well a miraculous thing happened from my home um all the way up the hill towards the the highway along past daily city there um all the way along there i got a run of green lights absolute poetry absolute poetry i i've never had a run of green lights like like that before um I never got out of third gear. The thrust in second and third gear, if you remotely approach the the top end of the power band, is it it is. You, I've said it before on the pod, and no doubt I'll say it again. It it is. It is a motoring experience without parallel. Um, there's never a moment where you're not where the the straights are, are just shortened, and and the turns become exercises in balancing that enormous thrust with how low you feel comfortable with leading the motorcycle and frankly what the surface of 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 the road looks like in 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 this particular situation i i you know i i i really believe this is truly one of the seminal motoring experiences like the the thrust of road motor motoring experiences the thrust of of a four cylinder uh, Japanese sports bike uh, along a along a road like that, and I think um, you know, does it enhance it that the bike's completely analog? Um, I don't think so, really. You know, um, John always says to me, you know, I should never ride a BMW S one thousand RR because if I did, I would then you know never want to ride any of the old bikes that, that I've got because the S1000 RR is just perfect. Um, I don't know. I've never ridden one, right? So uh, so I don't know. It would also be a more expensive bike than anything that I've bought before unless I was to buy a really, you know, terrible used example. So uh, so the next day I thought having, you know, having had that one awesome ride and I had the same, a similar experience. I just, I just rode away from the house and, and back again. It was about you know, 15 miles or maybe road. Um, and I stepped off feeling absolutely awesome about motorcycles. I was reminded why I've, you know, filled my garage and, and fill my uh, hobby time um, with with the things and, and why I'm doing this Jigsaw Farm project at the moment to, with, with, with Aaron to, to try and, you know, make... Uh, to try and make them come alive while, you know, make them come alive in, you know, to historicize them a little, right? I feel that the, the stuff that's written are didactic histories. No one's writing a like vernacular history of the sports bike. So perhaps that's what I'm trying to do with this Jigsaw Farm project photo. Don't know what it's going to be. Comic book. Don't know what it's going to be. Project with uh with with aaron here um so yeah so i i rode the jigsaw i rode the k5 jigsaw up the hill and down the hill again and uh it was just stupefied by the motoring experience um uh it it 
however well a car handles, it never handles with the purity of even a not great motorcycle. And uh, Suzuki GSX-R, in any of its iterations, handles pretty well. And in that K5 iteration, really, it, it's a very easy, comfortable, approachable motorcycle to, to, to ride. And, and that makes the the performance feel accessible as as well so as i say you know i didn't go berserk by any means never got out of third gear um stepped off it feeling absolutely awesome and and understood why i'd filled the garage with motorcycles so the next day i was like well i'll ride again but i promised myself that i was going to do some kind of exercise on the peloton and i was like ah with the time and there wasn't going to be time to do both and i thought you know what i will do both instead of doing the peloton i'll ride my pedal bike oh you live on a hill right so inevitably you're going to have to like do some exercise riding back up the hill it's pretty off-putting actually because you know as you're riding home there's going to be this massive climb right at the end but at a certain point you know you just get used to it as part of the uh of, of the experience and also you know i'm lazy and unfit and it shouldn't be a massive climb to me it wouldn't be if i was uh if i was reasonably fit um anyway but when you leave you get to go down the hill don't you and it's funny how i am that the, the on the way down the hill, I said to myself, you know, I said to my wife before I left, you know, I'm going to try and do the hill without any breaks. It's the hill past the, the cliff house, just near our house. Um, you know, try and do the hill, no breaks. It's, it's like twisty corner. Uh, a shame to say I did have a little dab on the entry. I did my my eye was was distracted i was a motorcyclist and i thought he might have pulled out and i was looking for him to check and it meant i wasn't like fully focused on the line at least that's my excuse but i did have a little feather of uh, of rear brake before i uh, tipped in properly but uh but but yeah really enjoyed uh that bike ride of course that kind of ride um the sensation of speed is intensified by the fact that you are adrenalized um with a motorcycle the the adrenaline comes in as a you know sort of as a result of the speed almost rather than um uh, the adrenaline driving the speed in the way that it, it does um on on the pedal bike um astonishingly similar experiences though in that um i i uh i actually stepped off the jigsaw feeling more satisfied than i did step off the the, the pedal bike because i had uh um i had a moment of of uh, uh where one of my legs didn't quite work properly and i had to get off the bike and uh push for a minute and then i was crossing myself and got back on and uh rode on but uh yeah um Anyway, so the next day I got the, so day three, right? Ride number three. I had this, uh, uh, the, the K1 was was ready. It now has its ZX10 clutch modification in it. So uh, I took it up the hill as well in the same way, like rolled out of the city. I didn't get quite the same run of uh, of, of green lights as I did, but I got, uh, I got enough to feel confident that, F powerful as the k5 is especially with this you know remus can and and so on the so it's freer breathing than it used to have and it is noticeably punchier you know when you sh take a shift and come in another gear it does feel noticeably punchier and i remember that when i put on my on my 600 on my k1 on my k1 600 when they put a when i put a can on that it, it does really make it feel a bit punchier, especially second gear. Like when you go from first to second gear, it wakes the the, the bike up 
her the, the bike up a little bit. Um, I've got to say though, I f- I feel like picked up perked up as the K five is. I feel like that K one, which I think has race cams or something in it. I'm not really sure. Um, but either way, Neil built it himself, so you know um, that bike. It has a vim and a vigor that is just my word. I I think that because the tank's bigger, I think that because the riding position is a bit more uncompromised, I think that because the handling's not as good, let's call a spade a spade, you know, it is a fat bike. So you get that, it, it has... You know, on the K5, if you're paying attention, you feel like you can adjust the line in the middle of the turn. In the on the K1, that, there's not that same feeling. Um, I, so that means that if if you um, don't carve between the potholes, right? Yeah. Um, really, um, the the ride is is perhaps illustrated by the fact that the at a certain point, uh, having thrilled myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to ride the route that I rode when it scared the shit out of me and see if it's all right. And, you know, it was. It it really was. I I was confident um, riding it in, those, in that situation. And the only reason I did that was because I... I was already comfortable that the clutch was was not gonna bite me. It's it's made the K one as rideable as as the K five. And you're saying, well, what do you mean? You contradict yourself there. You didn't say that. No, what I mean is my first bike was a K one six hundred and and I find those bikes familiar and easy to use. You know, I, I, I'm not quite as easy to use as a GS 500, but, but I, I find them very familiar and comfortable. The K five is more developed and is more comfortable than, than that. If you look at the older bikes that, that I have, the older GS XLs, they progressively get more raw and harder, um, to, to use. I, I struggle with the shifts on, on, on a lot of them. I'm embarrassed to, to, to say. But let's not dwell on that. Let's just dwell on the fact that those three rides that I had in the last couple of days were, were really, really exciting. And and uh, when, you know, in, in the decades to come, as as we reflect on, on why people ride motorcycles or road motorcycles or why people want to do seemingly dangerous things for no reason other than their dangerous just for the for the thrill of it i i can't describe the level of spiritual fulfillment i felt from having the courage to be like i'm gonna ride that k1 and then when i didn't plan to ride the road that where it scared me but i did and in exact it's uh, and i had to sit in traffic in exactly the same spot where it tried to put me into the middle of the intersection under the wheels of of you know a honda minivan and uh, it was absolutely fine, and 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 I felt uh, comfortable with it, and uh, I'm actually keen to to ride it again. So uh, yeah, so so next, let's fix the Ducati's leaking clutch. It's leak clutch fluid all over the ground. It smells of gas. I assumed it was gas. Tried to tighten up a fuel filling, strip the head off a bolt. Go me, go me, mechanic extraordinaire luckily um it seems that that i'm not a great rider but it seems that i'm an even worse mechanic than i am uh rider best best generate some money in another way hadn't i I just did a pause there so old Saxon can uh, can can endow us. Because if I'm going to talk about England, right, I have to talk about sax. I have to have Saxon as the as as the soundtrack. So let's let's talk about what England is, right? Before I talk about England, let's talk about how England, before the coming of the 
Romans, it was Britain, right? Then the Romans came, the Romans went again. And then from all parts of Scandinavia, the Saxon, different Saxon tribes invaded, creating the Anglo-Saxons, as in this term that Americans will be familiar with, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, yeah, because this is the, the, you know, from England, Scotland, Wales, this this kind of... Uh, this this kind of, of neck of the woods. Um, so what happens to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms? Well, 1066 and all that, the Normans, the French invade, and for a while, Anglo-Saxon England is an occupied kingdom by the Normans who speak French and use these newfangled devices that called castles to I- impose authority on, on the on the Anglo-Saxons who speak a, a, a completely uh, different language. But then about 300 years later, there's this fellow Chaucer and he writes the Canterbury Tales. And in the Canterbury Tales, he weaves together English and French into what we, what I was taught was called Middle English, um, the language that evolves into Shakespearean English and then in turn, you know, into the language that, that we uh, that we that you're listening to me speak today. So, um, so that's what Saxon is, right? That's the nation of so. So therefore, Saxon, the band who come from Bradford near near Yorkshire, uh, um, Bradford in Yorkshire, um, they seemed a perfect band to use for for my uh, you know visit to England. And, and for the fact that uh, a lot of the road trip that I did was was focused on visiting Neolithic sites of England, like Anglo-Saxon long barrows, like Wayland Smithy, for example, um, with uh, my son, who's who's nine, just soon to be uh, soon to be ten. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess. Uh, Let's begin um, at the top of my agenda here. Yes, that's right. I've not even got to the top of my agenda. That's right. Um, The rental car that I had. So I had these grand plans. I was going to do a lap of England. I was going to visit a range of Morton Bailey castles with Ollie. I was going to visit some places that I'd not seen before. I'd spoken to Chops Garage, Garage, Shops Garage in North Devon there. I was going to buy his black 160,000 mile Jaguar XFR, XF diesel, like 440 foot pounds of torque. I was so excited to buy that car was only bloody three and a half grand. But then I was like, I'm not going to go for that long. We had the dog. That was what really did it. We had the dog. So then I wasn't going to go for that long. And the trip just got much shorter. And I just focused on, on spending time you know, with, with, with my parents, cause I was just going to go with, with, with my son. So didn't need a car, wasn't going to do much driving, did have for a brief period, a car to do these Neolithic sites, just me and, and, and the boy, um, at the rental place, when we picked up, I said to the guy, when he said to me, you can have a Vauxhall Mocha. Um, I was like, Hmm. Now, I'm not quite sure. I wasn't quite sure why I, well, that was talking about, but like, it didn't sound good, did it? A car named after a coffee. It's like, you know, didn't sound like, you know. The guy was like, that BMW outside that just pulled up. He's just, like, it's badged a 320D, but it looked kind of the business. He was like, you could have that. I was like, how much more is it? And he was about to tell me, and I was like, ah, you know what? Don't, right? I'll take the mocker. And the reason I did it is because the mocker is a stick, right? And I knew that I was going to be able to have Ollie do the shifting for me, Um, which if you think of it, he's going to sat on the other side. So it's actually almost like, like you were driving a stick shift car in, uh, you know, in California where, you know, all cars are left hand drive, if that makes sense. So I thought, you know, that would be, uh, uh, you know, a useful, interesting experience for me because he, he does this. He does the shifts for me now in the in the Fiesta, 
um, when we uh, when we go to school. He's pretty good at judging uh, judging where we need to be. So he's got that important skill that I wanted to teach him, which is instinctively you know which gear to put it in. So when you learn to drive properly, you're just following the road signs and uh, knowing what gear to put it in and dipping the clutch and bringing it up gently and finding the bike point and all that stuff. You just already, you know, you already know how to do that. Yeah. So I said no to the BMW, um, thereby losing an opportunity to do a follow up. I realize now I did to do a follow up on. I wrote a piece and I'll link to it about uh, F90 328 that I had in Florida um, for Amelia Island. I went the only time I've been to the Amelia Island Concours. And there is a road in from the freeway to the Amelia Island Concours. And it was very quiet when I drove along it. And I confess I did behave like a hooligan along that road and was stupefied by how good that BMW was. And up to then, I guess it, it was so long ago, I'd not realized that I needed to get it into sport mode. And the car was just like Jekyll and Hyde. When you put it in sport mode, it was just all kinds of awesome. Out of it, in like eco mode, it was like some kind of Camry. It was like really not interesting to me. But I, I was just going to the show and it didn't bother me and I didn't want to get a speeding ticket. But then when I found this sport mode and I had this twisty road, I was like, oh, Oh, BMW, I love you. Um, so that was the F90. Um, and I think before then, um, my wife and I did a trip to northern Spain uh, where we were in Barcelona and we went to Sitka's Terramar, the bowl that's out there, you know, the, the Brooklyn's like banked racing track that's that's out there. And we had... Uh, um, we, I, what I remember about that is you, about that vacation is Europop and me setting the speedo at the whatever the kilometers equivalent of 120 miles an hour was because there was nobody on those roads. If you ever if you ever really want to do a motion vacation and you like ham, you like cold ham, and you don't mind the wines a bit rough. If you spend enough, the wines are all right. But you know, Spanish wines are always a bit rough, aren't they? They're always a bit like. Did I just, you know, am I t taking straw out of my teeth kind of thing? I just, I've just knocked an entire industry there. I don't want to say that, but you, you French, so Italian, what? It's um, bro, Spanish wines always have a bit of a roughy aftertaste, don't they? Well, they don't always. Right, I'm going to stop saying this. I can just edit out how I've abused the whole Spanish wine industry there, can't I? Um, but no, my point is, if you like ham and salami and that kind of thing this is a great place to travel if you like driving fast the highways the toll roads i guess nobody uses them they all the locals use the other roads and the toll roads i was the only person on them and it was all it was awesome um europop anyway so that was a good car as well that 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 i think that was the previous generation we had so anyway so i had the opportunity to do like an update on on a bmw 3 series euro spec like you know basey 3 series um but i spurned that opportunity so ollie could do the shifting um all right so i'm gonna make sure the dog's all right oh, he certainly is he's right there behind me I was just going to go and look for him. And he's right there behind me. That's perfect. Um, yeah, so I've got this mocha. It was white. It had these red trim pieces on it. And, I mean, they hurt my eyes, basically. Um, it was nice inside. Um and and my immediate impression, like in the first like hour of using it, was that the motor was kind of gruff but pretty pokey. And I think, um, I mean, it did. So I said a few on miser, but then everything seems like that to me in comparison to the stuff that I drive in the states. So you know, the BMW does like sixteen around town. I mean, it's it's really. Uh, uh, pretty outrageous the stuff that that we have in comparison the stuff that that people have in europe so um i i, I mean i i didn't look at the specs 
I, I thought it, I, I kept on saying to Ollie, and it was one of me, this is what I mean. I thought about the fuel economy because you didn't have to fill it up right until the end of the trip. And when we did fill it up right as we're pulling into the gas station, I said to him, do you think it's a gas or, or diesel? Because when you started it up, it was rough like a diesel. Um, but it was pokier than a diesel, but it was obviously turbocharged. You could feel it had the same kind of like come in low and deliver super linear power that modern turbos have, like the, my Fiesta ST has. So it has that, that um, feel about it, um, the way, but, but, you know, no, it was gas, right? So I reckon it has to have been a triple. So what I wrote down here was gruff, but pokey. Um, the other thing I liked about it, and this is a crazy thing, and I wonder if it's a conscious thing, but you remember the Vauxhall Viva HB, the second one, the one that had like the Coke bottle waistline, um, like the Escort Mark One. Didn't that car have a like a ripple down the middle of the hood? Um I feel like having that ripple down the middle of the hood, which the the mocker has, I feel like that's a sort of Vauxhall styling piece. And and that I thought was there's like a you know, there's like a, a ripple, a ridge down the middle of the, the hood, and, and that gave it from the seating position quite a nice view. Now, if I think of it now, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at the car because I didn't like the the exterior of it particularly but whilst i'm on the subject of the exterior of it we stayed at a pub that overlooked the uffington white halls so we're outside this pub and i noticed the second morning when we were having breakfast i, I mean literally you can see the white horse over the boy's shoulder as he's eating his like bacon and eggs i i, I realized as i like the uffington white horse is like at 12 o'clock and if i look to like three o'clock I can see a blue plaque on one of the houses across the street. Well, as we were driving out of the town, I had to look at who it was. John Betjeman. John Betjeman, Poet Laureate, lived there. Awesome. Obviously, Poet Laureate, appointed by the Queen, would have a house that looked out onto the Uffington White Horse across the, the English South Downs. And I really do love that part of of, of England. Anyway, so uh, the night before... I realised we were right by Betjeman's house. Um, we uh, The Fox and Hounds is the name of the pub. I can really recommend it. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, as Ollie and I were popping out to uh, uh, visit the White Horse, because like you get those lovely long evenings, English summer nights. Like California, it gets dark sooner and it gets cold. It doesn't happen like that in England. It retains the heat. So we like, we can get to the, we didn't check in till like five, six o'clock, something like that. But we had a drink and then popped straight out. Well, as we were like popping out to look at the white horse and get something to eat, um, this couple who were having a beer were like, oh, what car's that? We like that car. I was like, well, it's not mine. I'll tell you that. And they were like, oh, we like it. It's a, I was like, well, you know, it's a Vauxhall Mocha, I said to them. So, yeah. So, look, I didn't like it, but other people did, is, is my point. And what I did like, as I say, was how it drove. I mean, I've complained about, you know, it sounding a little bit diesel and so on. But, you know, let's be honest about that. I didn't give a shit about that, really. it When you asked it to go, it had enough. I didn't find it lacking. I didn't find the handling irritating. I found the the... I could place it exactly where I, I needed it to be. Now, I should say at this point, this is the second trip that I've done to England where I've told the GPS to keep me off main highways. So I've just stayed off the motorways and I've done everything on, on A roads. And, and what that means is you really do see England's green and pleasant land. But my word, the towns are snarled up now. So you have to be in like a mellow mood and ready to jam through the towns. And, and you know, when you're jamming through Cotswold towns and talking about Cotswold stone, and then, you know, you're watching, we're watching a TV show about idyllic bucolic England and it's the Cotswolds and it's, you know, exactly the town that Ollie and I were driving through. You're like, all right, you know, I do know something about how to, to provide 
a decent uh, travel experience for myself and for for people who were uh, who were along for the ride, both literally and uh, and metaphorically, and also right, not for nothing. I don't want to stop in some motorway services and eat a Burger King when I can stop at a fish and chip shop or in a pub and have, yes, equally unhealthy, but far more tasty and different food and couch it all in the terms of cultural experience for uh, for myself. Well, it is a cultural experience. I mean, all of the pubs we're going into, they're older than the whole of California, aren't they? That kind of blew ollie's mind that the pub that we went in he said 1845 i was like yeah five years before the gold rush and he was like whoa like eyes popping out of his head um uh so yeah so this mocker we had it down these little lanes all the time right and and even on these lanes um it was fine to be placed you know it was a lot better than my mustang would would have been you know because the mustang with that live rear axle if the surface is bad on a b road oh my word it it's it and if the road's damp well this mocker was fine is, is it is, was it as delightful as a fiesta st no was it a lot closer than i would have anticipated it being yeah so i guess this is a roundabout way of saying that i was actually all right with the car and i think i was although i am glossing over um a couple of really irritating things about it and let me go there with them now so once i was saying goodbye to my parents um we get in the suitcases in the car and so on i put one suitcase in and then close the boot trunk boot trunk boot boot trunk I hit the clicky button to open it wouldn't open couldn't open the trunk pressing it pressing it couldn't open it ended up opening up the folding seats and joking with my dad about the standard eight that we'd been looking at because apparently one of the differences between the standard eight and the standard 10 wasn't just the two horsepower extra that you got it was the the on the 10 you got a proper opening boot lid on the standard eight the it had a trunk shape there but the actual boot the trunk part there was no trunk lid it didn't open you could only access it by folding down the seats so we had a good chuckle about that and i got the uh the other seat belts in but i should say it just amused me that the as i was struggling to to do it and pushing the buttons and swearing at it uh, my mother immediately laughed um and i'm like yeah absolutely that's completely the right way to react to it because it diffused my frustration um with the whole situation uh it, immediately that my ineptitude with modern technology that i can't make the car uh unlock properly now it, it did get into that kind of pattern before i think what you needed to do was like do the lock and the unlock again and then it would like i do the trunk or something like that but uh, the point is the that um very complicated you know oh, all it needed was a button you know I, I i really there wasn't actually that much wrong with the you know the key that you put in the lock and turned and you know popped the trunk um uh, that it utterly defeated me whatever advantage it offers that it utterly defeated me not once but twice that seems to be pretty poor design doesn't it i mean i know um i'm inept but i i still yeah i i'm just bemused by it as a piece of design now the other thing that it did and this was just gobsmacking to me is is when you went five miles an hour over the speed limit it chimed at you like an american seatbelt chime you know not like a eh, 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 just a like a bong 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 like i'm there i'm annoying i'm like i'm dragging at your i'm not nipping at your ankle in a meaningful way i'm just like dragging at you like i'm dragging you down like a piece of until eventually you're gonna i mean i i, I now 
Ollie found a way to defeat it. There was like a menu and you could defeat it whenever we got in. But whenever you turn the ignition off, when you restarted the car, it came back in again. I, I mean, I mean, I, I just, just, I just, just, I, I mean, it was only 20 years ago when that GSXR 1000 K5 that I'm looking at came out, a bike that can do 102 miles an hour in first gear. Now, I know that nobody needs a motorcycle that can do that, or a road machine on the road. I know, responsible, blah. But tell me how it can be a step forward to go from something as glorious as that, as the something that made me feel as sublime as that. How can it be a step forward to go from that to bong, bong? I'm sorry, Dave, I can't let you do that. I'm sorry, Dave, I can't let you do that. Like, no, no, burn it down. Smash the machines, smash the machines, I say. Smash this. This is Bo and Luke do. They fight the system, any system. The boy wanted to go back to the National Motor Museum at Bewley. We went last summer. It's near where my parents live. Um, I was an intern there. That's really, I, I, I mean, I, that wasn't what I called it in period, but, um, you know, so I worked there, what, 30 years ago now, nearly, um, they really do a very, very good job at fulfilling the mission, which, which is to tell the story of motoring in Britain. So that's partly the story of the Bewley family, the Montague family, who were motoring pioneers. And, but it, but it's also to have examples of cars like the Hillman Imp. So we can tell the story of, you know, Linwood and, you know, industrial decline and, and, and all of that. So, um, you know, I, I, I thought that it was a significant and needed development that, Ari Vartanen's Rothman's Escort rally car, an iconic car for my generation and people older than me, had moved amongst the rally cars deep into the collection. And in the foyer, its place was taken by a pristine Sierra Cosworth RS500, something which has resonance for people 20 years younger than me not just people my age and 20 years older and I'm, I'm 50. Um, the thing that the National Motor Museum really tells a great story on is, is the land speed record cars. Um, so that's some of Malcolm Campbell's Bluebirds. It's my, you know, I would say all time favorite motor vehicle, um, the Napier Irving special, the, the Golden Arrow first car to 240 miles an hour and uh, i also love the 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 slug the the red thousand horsepower sunbeam that that seagrave took to 200 miles an hour in in 1927 now that car is undergoing a complete restoration and it is stripped to the bone and i spent probably a good 45 minutes just watching the videos and looking at the progress that they've made and and just amazed that this you know tack welded thing could house these two 22 and a half liter 400 horsepower aero engines you know it just boggles the mind and there's you know uh what looks like a uh you know a a a, a, a seat from uh you know a, that you'd sit on at the beach um you know with no seat belts or anything like that in between these two giant roaring engines 
um yeah awesome so uh so they've made good progress with that and and i wanted to mention the the thousand horsepower sunbeam because um they're looking for for people to to make donations and and really if if you listen to this podcast and if you've ever been amused by any stories i've ever told you know it's don't buy my merch such as it is go not that i've even created any yet don't it, it give money to the national motor museum so they can do this project to get not just one but both engines rebuilt and running again and the car back to daytona beach for 1920 um for the centenary in 2027 um yeah uh they had a really great exhibit looking in detail um it was to do with it was some photographer but it was the detail it was he had done detailed photography and then it was telling the story of the of the various objects and it was uh, objects around um seagrave's golden arrow um really i spent the um i i really immersed myself in that part of the museum and i, I realized that the museum does a very good job at delivering the kind of of level of you know i'll pot around and i'll look that that works for most people the kind of uh information that is right to make my son really passionate about the cars that the he likes um he dragged my mother around and and talked endlessly at granny about cars which must have been a little bit of deja vu for granny i would uh i i would have said um but yeah, when they went outside to do the adventure playground and the zip line, I just fell down this hole of this exhibit around Golden Arrow and and the people around it. I didn't know much about Captain Irvine, the guy that had designed it. I knew nothing about Seagrave's wife before, so there was a lot of of color uh, around that. And I, I really just wanted to say bravo to to the team at the National Motion Museum for delivering that kind of of, of in depth experience if you if you want to go deep the depth is 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 really is, is really there as well as if you want to just you know pot around and be like oh i remember when the xjrs won le mans uh the silk cut jags i remember them um you know if that's the level you want to be at they have that if you're like oh, i remember senna's marlboro mclaren yeah right cool yeah but also you know they have a porsche 917 the was and you know it's a german car what's that doing in the british motor museum well it was a british team wasn't it jw automotive with the golf sponsorship british team um so that's why the uh the cars there they have a good story um on motorcycles they have a really wonderful rudge from the 30s race bike um they do a, a good story you know enough for most people of you know story of the british motor industry um, motorcycle oh well, you know industry um they also do a piece about motorcycling in the 90s and they have a suzuki gsxr and um i was astonished that the bike was there last time it's of course a slabby um in suzuki race colors um I was astonished that the bike was there before and and was so astonished that the gsxr was there and so amused that the plinth uh, refers to the bike as a real hooligan machine that i i was just completely smitten with that i almost didn't look at the bike properly well of course since then i've added a slabby to the to the collection here and and my bike pardon me which was john's bike um was owned previously by a guy who raced them and this bike was his spare so it was race prepared it's been safety wide and all that but it is you know when they talk about oh it's a clean bike um i was thinking well, what the devil does that actually mean does he mean it's physically clean or no this bike is absolutely a clean bike yes it's physically clean but you can just see that all the parts are, are, are original uh you know none of the screw heads have been buggered none of the uh, uh you know it's it's just absolutely together as you would expect somebody you intended to race it would would make it now i guess um part of the fairing got scratched and it's been done completely and he had it completely redone in in blue 
so maybe you know maybe it was down maybe he redid the work on it i'm not really i'm not really sure but the point is that as it sits now my bike is a nicer example of a first generation suzuki gsxr than they have in the national motor museum I'm happy to share it with them, I would say, although I don't think they'd want it because it doesn't have that iconic Suzuki race plastic on it. If it had those colours on it, it's a museum piece. But uh, in some ways, I'm glad that it doesn't because uh, I actually want to ride it a little bit. But that was uh, a revelation and really cool for me that, uh, you know, my bike's better than the one in the National Motor Museum. So up in the Midlands, there's that museum that they used to call Gaydon, and I think now they call the British Motor Museum, which is rather confusing, National Motor Museum and British Motor Museum. But um, all the time it was, you know, I just thought it was Austin and Morris. I was a bit like, Blair, that's going to be depressing. I don't want to look at Maestros and Montegos. Um you know, and read again about how the Allegro's Cortex steering wheel wasn't really such a bad idea. Like, just no... Um, that's how I used to feel about that museum. But then the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust moved there. And if there's one British mark I really love, it's, it's Jaguar. And then just recently, I mean, I've never been that hot on Triumph motorcycles, but just recently I've begun to think about Triumph. And, and I guess my father had a friend who had um, Triumph 2000s. Well, he had a, a Triumph 2000, then he had a couple of, of we had 2.5 PI, and then he had a 2.5 S, I think, as, as, as well. Um, I always remember the the 2000, it was a Mark One. it was white, it was rusty, it had a red leather interior, it changed my mind forever about how cool uh, a, a car could, could be. I just absolutely loved just the whole smell and feel of, of, of that old Triumph. And remembering that car as I got older, I began to feel, well, I should revisit Triumph as the cars because my, my son loves the gt6 and and uh you know a number of them came here and and you know they're an affordable doable kind of proposition here so i was thinking wow would i do a gt6 um you know i definitely would love to do a, a, a 2000 that mechanical fuel injection just think that's the the coolest thing um i actually prefer the mark ones to the mark twos would love if i was like you know if i was ross perot i'd i'd have a early pi um in my uh in my collection for sure so so it was with that in mind that i wanted to go to the uh to the to the british motor museum went around with my dad and with my son um really really good experience you know my son's super passionate about the jaguar formula one cars um i remember you forget how many rileys and alvises there were that had really rakish bodies put on them and i think that was what i i took away i i did some real i took some good photos which of course i've not looked at preparing for this like why why would you um look i've even put on the notepad here look at my photos before talking imagine that <laughs> You know, I, I mentioned before how you, you tend to feel it's like death by Austin and Morris. And, you know, I never was an Austin and Morris guy. I was always a, uh, um, you know, outside lane, you know, hot rod Ford or, or BMW or, you know, what Jaguar. I always feel like if you cast me back to the 1970s or the 1960s and were like, and, you know, what would I what would I have and drive? It, it would be old Jaguars um, and probably some Fords and maybe some Alfa Romeos and maybe even some Lanciers, but definitely old Jaguars. Um, and it's funny, I, I mentioned earlier, I was going to have a look at my photos and by the miracle of modern technology, that's what I've, I've done here. Um, and almost every photo I took at the museum. And in fact, at the Leamington Spa car show that, that we went to was as well. Um, 
is of a Jaguar. So um, some of the Formula One car, some of the Formula One car's engine with Ollie admiring the welding, um, some of an XFR that was Jaguar's fastest saloon car or fastest Jaguar ever or something. I can't remember exactly how fast it went, but either way, it was a bog standard X as a bar mechanically that they just did up for, uh, you know, like blanked off the grill and lowered the suspension and all of that kind of stuff. I'll include a picture of it. Car looked awesome. I'll include the photo of the plinth as well. Um, you could overlook the workshops where they were doing, you know, where they had a couple of the um, Jaguar sports cars, you know, from the Group C era around that they were doing some work on. And so it was cool being able to to overlook that. Um, the Leamington Spark, well, the Leamington Spa Car Show was an altogether really cool um, British, uh, you know, Sunday afternoon kind of experience. Um, you know, I went with my whole family. Um, there was a little museum that my mum and, and sister walked around while... Um, Ollie and, and my dad and I potted round the field and looked at the cars. I would say a remarkable number of American cars nowadays, and of course at, at, at British car meets in general, and often not really very good examples, sadly, often like not great examples that have been sort of gussied up in a not very tasteful way. Um, but maybe that's the case with most car shows and I shouldn't be a hater. I should, should be a lover. And, and, you know, um, there was a, a really nice B body charger, um, for 68, I think it was, um, yeah, it was a 68, wasn't it? Um, air primer gray, um, that, you know, was stanced right and, and look, look good. And I guess it, I, I do like the fact that British people don't worry too much if it's like great under hood or if the paint's perfect, you know, you can take it to a show, um, really whatever condition the, uh, really whatever condition the car's in. Um, I photographed three cars at the show, um, an Audi and, and two Jaguars, um, the Jaguar E-Type because, I've really kind of fallen in love with with e-types uh, afresh I, I i feel um i would love to have an e-type at some point it would have to be a series one um and to have to be in that, that patinated condition i think if i'm going to do a british car you need to you know i talked about like in triumph gt6s well i do but you know the e-types the the sort of pinnacle of, of of that so the british motor museum looking at the jaguars made me feel that and then um, you know, and learning the story of William Lyons made, made me feel that. And then the following day at the car show, as I say, I, I photographed two cars. Um, well, this, this Audi coupe that we'll talk about in a minute, but uh, this beautiful E-type British racing green and also a really lovely um, XK120 um, that would have been my car of the show. It was just a lovely, original, patinated example. I'll include some photos um, so yeah, so, you know, in the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust, it, it talked about William Lyons, um, age 21, buying a motorcycle sidecar and then deciding he wanted to go into partnership with a guy who'd built it for him. So it's the beginning of Swallow Sidecars, but because he was under 21, he needed his parents to sign for him so he could like set up and, and do the business and, and the plaque in in the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust at the British Motor Museum has this wonderful line in it um, about how this displayed Lyons early this this displayed his the this this you know this was an early demonstration of the aptitude that would would of the uh, you know of the two skills that would serve him so well later in his career his eye for style and his business acumen. What they wrote was much slicker than what I just said, but if the point is that Jaguar is the eye for style and business acumen. That's why, that's why they survived. And, and also they understood that thing. Jaguar um, in the classic period and William Lyons understood that thing that 
uh, Luca de Montezemolo talked about and it is misogynistic. It's you see a beautiful woman across the room. Ah, you invite her out to dinner. You have dinner with her. If she's not that, if the conversation is not all that, if she is a little boring, if she is not intelligent, you know, suddenly she's not so attractive, is she? Whereas if when you drive the car, it has this incredible performance as well. Oh, then at that point, really, you know, if the car, if, if, if the drive impresses you as much as looking at her across the room did when you first saw her, you know, it has to be the duality of, of experience. That was the point that, that de Montezemolo was, uh, was, was making. And, and um, that's the point that William Lyons understood and is perfectly demonstrated in the E-type was it looked awesome, but by God, it was fast too. And I think, you know, my, bullet mustang has 265 horse so did those early e-types and and really you know that's going to make them feel sprightly not fast by modern standards but you know sprightly enough for me especially on those uh on those narrow tires the audi um early 100 coupe there were actually two at the show and i don't know whenever I was thinking to myself the last time these two were together was, you know, probably when they came off the ferry, right? All those years ago, 1969, 1970. Um, I mentioned the car because my grandfather had one. And the interesting thing is, is the car I photographed is ice blue. And I thought that that was the color that his was. My dad was like, no, it was navy blue. And it's funny how uh, over the years I'd somehow forgotten. Um, there was a single photograph of it. I don't remember the car itself. But yeah, that car was a 1970 so you'd have had it not long before uh, before i was born i may have even um you know crossed over because i was born right at the end of uh, end of 73 um so yeah so two of these audi 100 coupe three quite elegant cars worth googling around on a little bit if you were uh, if, if you know my dad told me that uh, his mum never liked it and that's why um my grandfather ultimately had uh, had gotten rid of it I don't know why she didn't like it. I should have asked my dad, shouldn't I? So the other museum that we went to was the Brooklyn's Museum. I know the museum quite well. I was a member of the the Brooklyn Society for for a well, decade or so before I uh, before I left England actually for a few years afterwards and then the Brooklyn Society which is the people who tried to preserve the track merged with the museum and it was acrimonious and I can't remember exactly what the outcome was but anyway all of that's in the rear view now and they have a really great setup now and and uh, um, you know mostly thanks to the fact that Mercedes bought most of the land and and therefore what brooklyn's is is an adjunct to a sort of mercedes driving experience and a really rather a nice hotel that i'll put a link in that if you're flying in and out of heathrow is super super convenient and i urge you to stay out whether or not you like cars it's it's nice if you like cars it's a must stay um, my son and i didn't stay there because i booked too late and it was uh, and it was booked up so now when you go to brooklyn's it's always accompanied to the sound of an amg turbo muffled v8 turbo raw um as you because when you park up the uh they're coming up and down they're driving up and down the uh, test track there you know all the uh all, all the people having their amg driving days so um for my son the standout of of Bro of brooklyn's was that uh in the formula one shed they have uh they have a couple of McLarens. Um, they have one that is, uh, um, l I think, Lewis Hamilton's 2008 show car. Um, anyway, my son was too low to uh, f fit in, but I asked, could he, because it was qu a quiet day, could he sit in? And the guy said, well, if he can see over the steering wheel, he can have a go. And it, what it is, is a simulated lap of Brooklyn's, but in hamilton's formula one car 2008 mclaren mercedes you know 900 horsepower formula one car downforce right so 
and it, and but you know he's going i can see the guy thinking this kid's going to be absolutely hopeless but ollie listens really well and is able to get out of the pits even though it's like a difficult negotiation out of the pits because it's the real brooklyn's pit so you have to go left and then left up onto the the top of uh you know the narrow end of the of the egg if you think of the shape of uh of, of brooklyn's anyway um after a sort of sighting lap where it wasn't clear to me or the guy if if Ollie um, could get his foot right the way down on the throttle or or quite what was happening um, at a mere 138 miles an hour, he then got the hammer down properly and was lapping at more than 200 miles an hour using um, the Vickers sheds as the clipping point, you know, on the, the side of the egg that has the, the, the dent on it. Anyway, so he had one go. Then we walked around the museum and he begged at me to have another go add another go got the guy to explain in the line to him did exactly what the guy told him to do and uh promptly set fastest lap um maybe of the day but probably um you know for a where, however long i think it'll be quite a hard lap to to beat because uh it seemed to be completely uh completely online so we will uh so yeah, so my son was very proud at, at setting that, that lap and it was a surreal experience for me to realise that he now knows Brooklands better than I do because he's actually driven Brooklands in a way that uh, in a way that I I haven't. Um now my photos of Brooklands are all of the racing motorcycles because really um when I go there now that's the, the the experience that I have and I'm gonna include a photo of, of one bike which uh is just what is so delicious about automotive history in 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 general that this bike um new was was raced at the track before the war and then during the war was ridden by an employee at vickers um, the aircraft factory that's at brooklands because brooklands is the home of british aviation as well so when there wasn't motor racing there there was aviation there and of course in the war aviation meant you know, building warplanes and the pace of development was just incredible. And anyway, this guy got to and from the uh, got to and from his job at, at the Vickers Aircraft Factory on this ex Brooklyn's race bike, a Norton. Well, after the war, it passes to one Dennis Sergeant Jenkinson, that is to say, the DSJ of motorsport fame. Um, well, I mean, for me. Uh, as a teenager in in suburban Plymouth, reading Dennis Jenkinson's stories about you know driving across uh, France in his E type, um, going from one Grand Prix to another, and and you know that was I was like, that is the lifestyle I want to lead. I remember vividly uh, thinking that. And really fixing that uh, in 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 my mind, I, I, I've been moderately successful at that, I suppose. Um, but yeah, this was the the the, the vision to be uh, to be Dennis Jenkinson. Um, so that bike to be a Norton, a race Norton, a race Norton with Brooklyn's history, with a contiguous history of this, you know, wartime usage and then DSJ, just what an, an awesome piece. And that's really, you know, what they have at Brooklyn's, you know, just summed up really, really, really well. I've, I'll include some photos of, of a Bentley they have. I happen to believe the body on this Bentley is about the most elegant that I've I've seen um, uh, that the boy and I also did this awesome Concorde experience that he was was really keen for where um, this guy told us all about Concorde and we went round and we sat on it and did like a simulated sort of takeoff and and um, it really was a, a, a fun experience I mean you need to you know, it's like a piece of theatre. You need to immerse yourself in it a little bit because, of course, the plane's sitting on the runway. It's not taking off. But really, you're left with with this sense um, of, of once there was a sense of can do and these amazing things were achieved. And, and we, we seem to be, you know, worried about our mental health now instead. And I, I don't know. I mean what was very striking to um to me was a point that the guy made was that when you look at the avro biplane 
you know, that that flew from here in 1908 or 1911 or whatever it was, right at the dawn of flight. The gap between that plane and Concord is less than the gap between Concord first flying in 1969 and where we are now. And that really makes you think about how, um, well, to use the, the words of, of our former president, Obama, um, progress is not linear. Um, and that really illustrates it, doesn't it? So, so Concord is this odd combination of this sort of very old fashioned 1960s, like you've seen it in a James, in a Sean Connery, James Bond movie kind of technology but all like wrapped up in this like stupefying, like, you know, Mac two with the hull, with a fuselage of the plane being hot enough to melt an egg on. And then you're in New York in three hours. I mean, the, the lifestyle implications of it are incredible. And, and they have a display in, in the, the plane itself of all the different airlines that expressed interest in it. And there were a dozen airlines that expressed an interest in, in buying them. Um, but I guess Boeing were so shit scared that they were going to be eaten alive that they created the environmental lobby in the US who were like blur noise. Um, well, if you think of it, really, is, is Concord, yeah, is noisy, but is it any noisier than... A 747 i mean not really right it, it was mostly about boeing um being uh, uh terrified of of the lead that the europeans had, had developed i think so so that was was a narrative that i'd never heard before and i it was just convincing because this cabinet was full of every you know great airline you can think of from that period who'd expressed an interest in concord and even put down deposits and then the environmental lobby in the US shut them down and then eventually they were only able to fly into New York and they just really were, were able to asphyxiate the, the the whole project. And it's really um really a tragedy. It's it's really, you know, it's the British motorcycle industry, it's it's British Leyland, it's it's really a, a tragic story. And I guess I'd never engaged with it in in period. I mean I just rode the Suzuki Jessica exiles and was like I just didn't care about the British motorcycle industry. It had gone by the time that I um, was learning to ride. And I've only really investigated it, you know, recently. And, and I should, you know, should say, like, share a, an, an anecdote. You know, the last time I went to Birmingham, I did my thing where I picked out various projects and I wanted to, to go and investigate it. Um, there was this wonderful motorcycle called a Montgomery um, I'll include the photo of it that they had at the National Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham. I went to the place where it was built. It's a terraced house now. I'll I'll do a street view um, link to it. Um, that so that was kind of mind blowing. Um, There's one of those places where the neighbours are all you know looking out the window, being like, "What what fuck you doing, Mister?" Um, at you turning around your you know rental car which although it's a base level rental car is still by far the nicest car on the street kind of uh, kind of thing so that was uh, that was that experience um, but that day I also drove to BSA's factory and if you look at any of the you know photos of the BSA factory there's a street and a sign that says uh, that says BSA so I went there now and and I went there um, I don't know how many years ago but anyway when I was there what the BSA factory or part of the BSA factory was being used for was by uh, by one of these businesses that sort of um, customizes AMG Mercedes like you know puts the um, you know the the that extra bling that works for a certain demographic um, but is more than the German designers were ever going to do. This is a shop that, that does just that. And I thought, wow, is that is, is what's happened to, uh, to the BSA factory and it, and it, and it really is. So um, yeah, so I, I didn't, um, I didn't really, that was the first time I'd really engaged with British motorcycle history. Of course, um, British automotive history. I mentioned that you know, I I, I was put off the, the the British Motor Museum because you know I didn't want it to be 
I wasn't interested in paying homage to, uh, um, you know, Austin and, and Austin's and Morris's. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't, and it's interesting. That's why I said, I thought it was interesting that, that, that in the foyer, they had a pre three liter, uh, and a Granada 2.8. And, um, the, the, I live in America now and, and just how this is junior America is very, very obvious. Now it wasn't obvious to me in period. I just thought they were cool cars. I didn't see the whole like aping Americana. Um, that's so obvious. It's crazy that, that I didn't looking back. Um, but I didn't, um, yeah, you know, what makes the Mustang great made the Capri great. Um, and the formula the Ford had where you did a bit of flash and a lot in terms of, you know, either performance or, um, you know, velour and faux wood and velour and real wood trim. I mean, my, my Cortina Crusader had real wood trim in it and was a really comfortable car. I mean, that was the thing about um, Cortinas. They really were comfortable places to be and then the granada with that v6 motor was you know with a five-speed manual that was was you know a, a in period a meaningfully fast car although i should say and i mentioned on the pod before i feel like you know the jaguar mark ii was was overlooked i should say yes it was a meaningfully fast car it was uh you know 160 horsepower and it could do 120 miles an hour when most cars could struggle to 100 miles an hour. So, yes, it was a, a fast car, Capri 2.8. Similarly, if you think of, of stuff like, you know, Escort XR3, XR3i, this is like a, a 100 or 100. And, you know, I remember my dad's Sierra 2 liter I was 115 horsepower. So, you know, this is, is low. Uh, this is, you know, low horsepower in comparison to Jaguars, because right from the era of the Mark II with the 3.8, these are 200 plus horsepower cars, um, 130 mile an hour cars. Really, uh, Jags were the fastest thing you, you could buy. If you put me back in time and were like cheap and fast, what would you do? I'd be in the classifieds finding a manual transmission Jaguar the cleanest big capacity manual transmission Jaguar I could, I, I could find. Good morning. We went to Brooklyn's. I, uh, got up and was persuaded by the boy to go out for breakfast rather than just eat straight away. And uh, we found a breakfast place, but then it turned out it was a hotel. And by that time it was half past 11. And I was just like, you know, I remember why I just fucking hated Guildford. I just remember why I hated Guildford. And we got out on the highway and I guess that piece of the M3 now is all like this 50 mile an hour, like average speed check. And I'm just like, wow. 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 So there was this band, the Mac lads, very, very offensive. I mean, only, you know, gangster rappers, Snoop Dogg came close to the level of offensiveness that the Mac lads achieved, but and with more poetry, Snoop Dogg than the Mac lads, the Mac lads were just really, really offensive. They did one song. The chorus of it was what the fuck, fuck, fuck have they done to me, pub. And I really feel like that about, parts of England with these average speed limits and nowhere more than that top of the M3 where it joins the M25 because man those that I know that piece of road really well and and you know I used to I mean I'm not going to name the speeds that I used to come up there in in company stuff that I used to have at that kind of time and and the the slip roads they're now single lane they used to be two lane and and so you used to be able to really have a enjoyable experience if you were coming off the m25 and going onto the m3 it was a lovely you know it was it was a bit like the the left right sharp right at the end of the long straight at the nurburgring 
it was like uh, you could come off the motorway, come off the M25, and it was like an elbow left and then a sharper right. Um, and you needed to get some braking done bef- anyway um, in the Vectra that I had at the time. The Vectra was like an understeery monster through through that uh, through that long sweep. Well, now it's all like 50 miles an hour. Like, I feel like, what the fuck, fuck, fuck have they done to me, pup? I really, the hog's back, the hog's back, the piece of road that Mike Hawthorne raced along to his death in his Jaguar doing 130 miles an hour. Average speed check. Average speed check of 50 miles an hour. The problem is everyone does it. So you just, everyone's driving along next to each other at 50 miles an hour. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't live there anymore. Um, you know, I, I can take a speeding ticket, can't I? So I'm not saying I necessarily speeded, but what I'm saying is if I get a speeding ticket, it's not the end of the world. So I, um, I'm above the law. Um, or I can feel as if I am. Um, and I don't feel like I'm above the law. I just feel like I have to be free I feel like this is so wretchedly unfree. That's what I feel. This is so wretchedly unfree. There's no freedom of the open road. If I'm driving along at 50 miles an hour behind the guy in front, average speed check. I mean, this is this is the thing. We're going to move slowly into automation because so much driving is not going to be real driving it's going to be average speed check already is average speed checking along behind the guy in in front these 20 mile an hour speed limits in cities like paris or or in wales at the moment i mean there is increasingly less freedom of of the open road and it is i mean i began today with a story about, with three rather poorly told, actually, stories about how much joy riding fast on motorcycles gives me, or riding fast on bicycles gives me, how much joy going fast, throwing caution to the, not throwing caution to the wind, but just having an enjoyable motoring experience. And and this is just crushing all the joy out of motoring. And therefore, for me, crushing a lot of the joy out of life and that makes me really angry and it's completely unnecessary and i know lots of people and i know safety blah but you know i it it, it was personified for me by the experience that my son and i had at stonehenge now you won't be aware and i wasn't aware at the time but some twats just stop oil twats through oil through paint on the stones and i don't want to talk about that necessarily at the moment but but what it meant was that i think the overall i'm going to say it nazification of stonehenge was was even more complete and and you know we'd gone to avebury before we touched the stones at avebury we walked the avenue of the giants um we sat in the pub and, and had a you know, and we we'd had a great, you know, proper, ex, proper amongst the stones kind of experience. Because if you don't, if you're not aware, there are two thousand, two or three thousand stone circles across England, Scotland, across England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Northern France, especially Northern France. So, given all these stone circles, Stonehenge is merely the biggest. So I understand why people want to go to that one. It's the only one with the lintel stones as, as as well. Now, when I was a boy, you could still walk under the stones. I'm not sure if I ever did, but you could. By the time I was a teenager, um, you there was a road that ran up the, the side of it. There always was a main road that ran past it, but there, it, it was at a junction and they have turned that taken that junction away and it's now grassland um 
you used to be able to, there were a couple of roads nearby. You used to be able to get up that side road and then you could turn and, and near where Woodhenge is, you could turn and look at Stonehenge without, um, you know, needing to be on the road and really close where it's hard to see, where you can actually see it spot in the land because it's not on a high spot of land. It's, it's slightly da- downhill. So there were two or three of those roads that I was ready to try. The, the last time I was there, it was probably, it's probably got to be 10 years ago now, um, it was the era of the Black Mondeo that, that I had. I remember parking up there and actually climbing up onto the hood. It was a terrible paint, that car. So I just climbed up onto the hood and sat on the roof. And I remember um, looking out across Stonehenge there and and, and realizing that, that it was the 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 center of the uh, of visualizing how looking across you know Salisbury Plain there you could visualize how Woodhenge was there as well and and really having a profound Stonehenge moment and I wanted that for my son um you know I didn't want him to be like oh you know you know give me a you know give me a tie-dye t-shirt straight away Jerry Garcia's my new hero kind of thing I wasn't expecting that I just wanted him to actually understand something because the last time um so the time I was there in the Black Mondeo, there was the beginnings of like a visitor center and you couldn't, uh, there was a car park nearby and you couldn't actually get close to the stones. You had to like go to the visitor center and buy a ticket and walk down or walk across the road. And if you just drove and parked up, you could just park in a car park and walk and look over the fence. And it wasn't that good, but you couldn't get close to the stones and walk under the stones anyway. Well, now they've closed that road that ran up the side of it. They've made it impossible to park anywhere on the main road that runs up the other side of it. So now the only way to do it is to go to the car park, which is um, up and uh, which is a good, I would say, two miles from the henge itself. Um, you have to go there. And so it's like a Disney experience, isn't it? It's like the fucking Getty Center in LA. You know, you go, you pay for the parking, you park the car, it's all nice and clean. You wait for the train, you ride the train up, you go ooh and ah at the art, you know. It feels like Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Yeah, that works in LA. Getty Center's cool. But, but for Stonehenge, for Stonehenge, I have to fucking ride some fucking bus and pay and be talked out by no hand was first built in the year 3000 BC. No, that's not what it's about. That's not what it's been about for many, many years. It's about the mystery of it. It's about that we don't understand. It's not about in the year 1066. It's not about that. It's about sensing something that's mystical and deeper and older than we can possibly fathom. So they bollocks that up and that pissed me off. But you see, I made the boy walk to um, uh, Wayland Smithy near Uffington Castle and I made him walk around Uffington Castle and we walked, um, we did Silbury Hill and we did, there's a, is it West Kennet Long Barrow? Um, if you've not, it is West Kennet Long Barrow. That's near Silbury Hill um, I and not far from Stonehenge and Avebury, close to Avebury. Um, that West Kennet Long Barrow, it's off the road. It's a bit of a hike, not too far. Um, that was really, really worthwhile. That's 5,000 BC, which just boggles the mind. That place, that tomb was already 3,000 years old when Avebury Henge was built. I mean, it just, you just, it, yeah. So uh, I enjoyed that. I think my son got a proper sense of, of of that um but the stonehenge experience was blunted by too much modernity too many people too many rules um and this bong bong for speeding and this um you know ah yeah like just just yeah i'm just i'm a grumpy old man aren't i just a grumpy old man um so we stayed at the Fox and Hounds. I mentioned that in uh, in this village near near Uffington. We stayed at the Princess Royal um, outside Farnham. Um, did that, of course, for the Mike Hawthorne stuff. Um, uh, it's just off the hog's back. And I can recommend it. The reason I've mentioned it is I've stayed there a couple of times. I know that's a, a, a really good, uh, good place to stay. Um, 
uh, so a lot of beer was consumed. The bacon is better in England. Um, Americans may disagree. My son traitorously even says he prefers the streaky bit of bacon to the round bit of bacon. But I'm telling you, the bacon is is better in England. Uh, I, I mentioned that I had a fit of peak and thrashed up the M3. Um, I eventually found a safe way, found the safe way right inside the Byfleet banking of Brooklands. And when we got out of the car, I always went, Ollie, do you realize what that is? And he went, yeah, it's the Brooklyn's banking. As much as say, like, duh. I guess when you've been to Daytona and you've seen Daytona, it's like kind of the same thing. But he was underwhelmed by that. But uh, I had two Safeway, um, two Tesco cappuccinos, a bacon bap, and most of Ollie's breakfast, and my own breakfast in a moment of extreme decadence before we went and uh, looked around the, uh, the the Brooklyn's museum. And so it's probably no wonder I felt a bit head spinny when it was 27 degrees inside the, the uh, Concord during the Concord experience. So we flew home to California. The following day, the day after we got back, it was the Hillsborough Concours d'Elegance. Um, and on the face of it, it's a provincial car show. Um, but Hillsborough's the province, Hillsborough and Atherton, which are uh, two of the nicer bits of, uh, of Silicon Valley. So the caliber of cars that turns out, oh my word, like really really cool cars um through a friend i was asked to to step in and and do a couple of tours um i did one for for the sponsor group um uh i wish i could remember their name i'll dub it in if i can uh, if i can remember their name um thanks to them for sponsoring the uh the show and all i i felt as if i did a pretty good tour for them i only had three quarters of an hour but people don't want the tour to be much longer than that do they um uh i guess the main news for so what can i say about uh so the main i i mean what should i say about the show um haggerty have a program of of junior judging and i was asked to lead the haggerty junior judges as well which uh Obviously, working with children and animals is always a bit intimidating. You never know quite what you're going to get, but also it's extremely rewarding. And in this case, um, by keeping the pace up and, and having a clear idea about what I wanted to do and, you know, applying the KISS principle of keep it simple, stupid, um, we really did a good job. So I asked um, my son which cars he thought we should include. And of course, that yielded a couple of things that um, some things that I would have expected to do the Can Am car made out of titanium with the 900 horsepower Chevy big block, you know, that, that, you know, was a, but he, Ollie also suggested we look at um, one of the Ferrari um, challenge cup cars that they had a little, little class of. And, and I, of course, had zoned out on the modern stuff and he thought that stuff was cool. And a lot of the kids in the group, um, they thought it was cool as well when we, when we went around and, and looked at them. So these are kids of all ages from like four and five up to, you know, 12 and, and that kind of age. So some kids that really know what they're doing, others that that, that don't. Um, I just told them what they really needed to look for was, you know, it was a concours d'elegance. And what elegance means is, you know, is it elegant? Or what does elegant mean? Well, really what it means is, is it cool? If you can find something about it that you think's cool or not cool, that's what we're really, you know, judging here. That's how you're going to decide which one is 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 your favorite, which one's the best in show. So we went from that to this 1929 Rolls Royce that has like a woody shooting brakey kind of body on it's not a shooting brake is it? it's got four doors so it's not a shooting brake it's a, anyway it's got a woody body on it lovely restoration on it well the guy had like the restoration books he had the whole tool roll they absolutely love the theater of that because that's what it's about right that's why kids can judge a car show perfectly legitimately because it's about the theater you know and and in the judging 
um, that was uh, that was reflected. The hood was open. We could see what was happening there. Um, looked at this Boss 429 Mustang. It's a car that I actually saw once parked up in the Stanford parking lot, in the Stanford Mall parking lot one time. It's a black 429 I mean, it's all you probably don't know. You may or may not know. All of them were four-speed top-loader cars, so it's just uh, it's a Mustang with a NASCAR motor, like it's the motor that was that Ford were going to use to defeat the legendary Hemi. You know, it's it's a Hemi-head Ford motor, but they weren't allowed to develop it because it was banned by NASCAR, so it only ever went into these Mustangs. Um, you know. I dare say they don't handle worth a damn because they've got this massive NASCAR motor and they needed to cut up the shock towers to make the motor fit and all this kind of thing. But, I mean, this particular car is black over black, um, 69. Really, just really, really looks the business. So talked about that car. Then talked about there was a row of Ferraris opposite. And you have to walk and talk when you do a tour, right? You can't. Um, you might want to talk about the hot rod at the other end of the field, but if it's at the other end of the field, it's going to take you five minutes to get there. You can't do that. You have to bounce around. You have to walk a little bit and talk a little bit, and you have to judge the cars that you're going to talk about based on that. Well, across the way, there was a Ferrari. There's a row of Ferraris. You can't ignore the row of Ferraris. Um, so I picked the best in a row of red 308s and 328s and that kind of stuff. There was a, a silver 330 GT C, I think they called it there. Yeah, Coupe. Um, anyway, but the last of that, like 250 area um, car, the 330, um, have a soft spot for that era of car. Did that job hot air ballooning in France all those years ago? Really nice hotel in the Loire Valley, Domaine de Beauvoir, hot air balloon client this German guy who'd made his money selling stamps of all things. How bloody 20th century is that? A millionaire from selling stamps. Um, don't know if he was a millionaire, but he could stay at Domaine de Beauvoir and he'd drive over in this red over tan Ferrari 330. This is before they were worth tons and tons. This is what, 95, 96. But it would always be covered in flies and have the yellow French headlights. It was uh, red over tan, but the tan was, it was just patinated. It was stone chippy. The Baranis were like, you know, wouldn't have said pitted, but you know, the car was was being driven, right? So uh, just, just, just awesome, right? So this car had that kind of, uh, this car's a silver over red leather anyway. So as, as the kids are looking at the car, bloke comes up, young guy, must be, you know, half my age, I, is like, um, you know, do they want to sit under the hood? Do they want to sit in? And I'm like, you the owner? And he's like, oh, yes, I am. And I'm like, well, my dad is. And I'm like, all righty, yes. Like, can we sit in? Because um, I'd just been talking about the interior. Then we looked under the hood. Wow, they, they the kids absolutely love that. Um, the guy and the, the guy was like, this is what I remember. The guy was like, these are the real judges, not those old guys. Don't care about those old guys. These are the real judges. And he's absolutely right because what I was talking with him about was he realizes that if we don't get little kids into it, if they, they're not around these old Ferraris, these old GSXRs, if they've never seen them or heard them run, they're not going to be into them. They're not going to give a shit. You care about the things that you've experienced yourself if you've never experienced them. So we are duty bound. So those kids sat in a Ferrari. They felt the Nardi steering wheel. You know, the owners made up. The kids are made up. I It was the moment that made my day when the guy rocked up and was like, do you want to sit in? It's just absolutely uh, awesome uh, car guy moment. Um. The 900 horsepower McLaren big block needs a rebuild every 12 hours. It was made completely of titanium. That was the particular wrinkle on this particular. I can't even remember what the name of this weird and wonderful Calam car was. Um, so those are the cars that I had them choose between. Every car got two point two votes, and then uh, um, the uh, the Ferrari won the the Ferrari 330 won the decider, which was. Um, if you think about the cars I, I chose, the Ferrari Challenge car, the pre-war Rolls Royce, 1929 Rolls Royce, um, the Boss Mustang, 69 Boss Mustang, the Ferrari 330 and the Can-Am car, those were the ones I chose. 
I feel like we achieved, we achieved a great compromise of, of elegance and, uh, uh, yeah, of elegance and performance, you know, and, uh, uh, by picking that 3.30. So, yeah, so that was a super um, enjoyable kind of experience at the Hillsborough Concourse. So I'm going to wrap up this episode that talks about the uh, my, my time in England by, by saying that that day that we went to Brooklands, um, that morning, um, my son was like, I want our breakfast out. And I went, well, I know this area. I used to work around here years ago. He went, well, you must know somewhere good to eat. I went, yeah. He went, what is it? I went, there used to be a bacon sandwich van just down towards Godalming. Godalming was the town I used to work in. There used to be a bacon. And, he, and my son went, no more bacon. I cannot do any more bacon. This episode has been brought to you by Grand Touring Motorsports as part of our Motoring Podcast Network. For more episodes like this, tune in each week for more exciting and educational content from organizations like the Exotic Car Marketplace, the Motoring Historian, Brake Fix, and many others. If you'd like to support Grand Touring Motorsports and the Motoring Podcast Network, sign up for one of our many sponsorship tiers at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. Please note that the content, opinions, and materials presented and expressed in this episode are those of its creator, and this episode has been published with their consent. If you have any inquiries about this program, please contact the creators of this episode via email or social media, as mentioned in the episode.